Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship at St. Andrews, and a particular welcome if you're a visitor to church this morning or a visitor to Penrith on your way north or south, and you've just dropped in. It's lovely to see you. A welcome to everyone who's joining us on the live stream. Uh, if you're joining us at the moment or you're catching up later, um, had a message just, uh, earlier this week from our friend Nadia in Australia saying how much she'd uh, enjoyed uh, our worship last week and picked one of her favourite hymns. Uh, so welcome to everybody who's joining us uh, on the live stream. It's lovely to worship together uh, as part of the family of God. It's always very special to be able to read bands of marriage. And we've got two sets of bands to read this morning. Uh, and so I published the bands of marriage between, if I find the right page, between Nathan Christopher Bailiff and Naomi Claire Weaver, both of this parish, and between James Edward Newman uh, of St. John's Hackney in London, and with a uh, connection to this parish, and Charlotte uh, Claire Bernard of St. James the Less Bethnal Green. If any no one knows any reason why either of these couples may not be joined in marriage, you must declare it now. And we do pray for them as they prepare for their marriage, and Hilary will include them in our prayers later, later this morning. And it's lovely to have Dorothy with us. Good to see you, Rebecca. We've been uh, giving thanks for Dorothy and giving thanks for the gift of new life. And it's lovely to see you back with us this morning. A very warm welcome. I wonder what you think of as unity. What image comes to mind for the church? Are we all different ingredients of the one glorious cake? Mixed together, having lost all our individuality to make something rather special? Well, I hope not. When I was younger, I was, uh, I was in a rowing club. Are we like an eight? where everybody's doing exactly the same thing, and if anyone does anything different, the whole thing goes belly up. I hope not. Or are we more like um, musicians in an orchestra, all doing something distinctly different, uh, and yet all with our focus on the music and the conductor, perhaps? Or do you prefer more of a jazz band as your image of unity, weaving together different themes in quite creative ways? What's the picture that you have of the unity uh, of the church? We'll be exploring that a little bit later uh, in our worship this morning. We turn to our hymn books, number 736. If we're able to stand, we do so. If that's difficult, it's perfectly fine to remain seated. 736, name of all majesty.
Jesus is Lord, and we gather to worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we do so together, the Lord be with you. Please do be seated. It's a lovely piece of opening liturgy, saying the Lord be with you and also with you. It's, it's asking that the Lord would help us to worship in spirit and in truth. And you're praying that the Lord will help those who are leading us in our worship will equally worship in spirit and truth. It's a really encouraging piece of liturgy that opens our worship. It's much more encouraging uh, than the, the, the vicar, because we've had a bit of trouble with the sound and the internet speeds and all that uh, of late. Uh, but one of, my, one of my colleagues was struggling with his radio mic, uh, and at the beginning of his worship said, there's something wrong with this mic, and the congregation all said, and also with you. <laughs> but it's a prayer, isn't it, that as we engage in these very familiar words that they have become spirit-filled words, and that Jesus, who is Lord, would speak those words to our hearts this morning. There may well be a word to encourage you, because the path you're on is really tough. There may be a word to challenge you, because the path that we walk together is a demanding and challenging path. It may be a word that reminds you of the brothers and sisters who are around you sharing that journey. It may be a word that prompts you about something you, you can do to share the good news of Jesus in word or deed with someone this week. So let's be still. And in the quietness, in our own way, let's ask that God would open our hearts and open our minds to hear the word that he would speak to each of us and which he would speak to us together this morning. A moment of quiet and then the prayer together at the bottom of page two. Come, Holy Spirit. Together we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So bringing the burdens that we carry, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who is both power and love, forgive you your sins, heal you by his Spirit, and raise you up to follow in the footsteps of his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. If we're able to stand, we do so, the Gloria. Jesus Christ. 
prayer for this week. Gracious God, you call us to fullness of life. Deliver us from unbelief and banish our anxieties with the liberating love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sit for the readings. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel is exiled in Babylon and he speaks of the accountability of each person. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, say the word of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they have committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the word of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you, according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, 
enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For the word of the Lord. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. That's where Paul finds the unity of the church at Philippi. Hymn 727, our prayer in response. May the mind of Christ my Savior dwell in me from day to day. 727. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I'll also ask you a question. If you tell me the answer, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say, well, why didn't you believe him? If we say of human origin, well, we're afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later changed his mind and he went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of the father? And they said, well, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in a way of righteousness and you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you didn't change your minds and believe in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please do be seated. I'm going to ask you to turn to the hymn we've just sung, 727. I'm going to use the first line of each verse. Uh, perhaps replacing the personal pronoun, my with the collective, us and our.
May the mind of Christ, our Savior, dwell in us. May the word of God dwell richly in our hearts. May the peace of God our Father rule our lives. May the love of Jesus fill us. And may we run the race before us, looking only unto Jesus as we onward go. Amen. Unity is everything. That's the message Paul wants the small church at Philippi to focus on. Unity is everything. It's not an easy time to be part of a church community. It's no longer the respectable thing to do. In fact, in many ways, it's quite countercultural to turn up here on a Sunday morning with a whole ragtag bunch of different people and affirm things that many people would say is just old-fashioned nonsense that no one really believes anymore. So it's certainly not the fashionable thing to do and not particularly respectable. It might be viewed as either a rather quaint club for those who like religious things, or, or worse, it might be seen as colluding with attitudes that should long since have been laid to rest, and does an awful lot to promote bigotry, prejudice, misunderstanding, discrimination, and is self-absorbed with itself most of the time. So being part of a church community is not an easy thing to do. Unity is everything. It's an old Jewish saying, if you put two rabbis in a room to discuss something, you'll get five different answers. What does unity look like? What does it look like in the church? The difference in our theology, our understanding of God and salvation and the nature of the church. Deep historical church, some that go back hundreds of years in the life of the church across the world, some which might be quite local and quite recent. Strong views about the best or most helpful worship styles. Personality cults and personality clashes. Different leadership styles. Very different opinions on complicated moral issues. Cultural politics and internal power struggles. And that's just the Church of Philippi in the first hundred years. Never mind the rest of us 2,000 years later. Unity is everything. Being part of the church is not easy. Let the same mind that was in Christ be in you. What does unity of mind look like? Is unity of mind me deciding to agree with person B, who's already been in a conversation with person C, who after talking to person D had changed their mind about something because they had heard what person A's first thought was, and you just end up with a silly game of all trying to decide what do we agree with. Or at the other end, of course, unity can be something horrendously destructive. The unity of the mentality of Nazi Germany that took to destruction Jews, gays, gypsies, and all sorts of other people who didn't fit the pure Aryan race. So unity in itself is not necessarily a godly thing at all. It can be a demonic thing. And yet again and again through Scripture, we encounter the prayer of Christ and the exhortation of the apostles that they may be one. What does unity look like? How can we ever begin to live in the way Paul urged that little church in Philippi? Have the same mind that was in you, that was in Christ Jesus. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, 
being in full accord, doing nothing from selfish ambition, but regarding others as better than yourselves. <sighs> That's a tall order, isn't it? Regarding everyone else and their opinion as superior to mine or me. The answer, and Paul will get us to it in a moment, the answer, of course, is that everybody must be focused on something other than themselves. And that something is not actually a task or an agreed goal. That something that they're to be focused on is not a strategic plan. The focus of their unity is not an agreed strategy. In fact, it's not a thing at all. The only focus of their unity is a person, is Christ Jesus. That's where Paul discovers the unity of the church, and that's where he urges the church to get back to whenever and how often that unity is threatened. If there is any love, any compassion, any encouragement in Christ, that's his opening words. Let your minds go back to that famous passage in John's Gospel where Jesus is praying for his disciples, I in them and they in me and me in you, Father, that they may be brought to one. It is only because we are in Christ that we are brothers and sisters. It's not because we might be Anglicans or prefer communion at worship. It's not because we just happen to live in Penrith at this stage of our lives. Our only unity must be that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we are sisters and brothers in Christ, then the person sitting next to you is of infinite value and infinite worth. The person you disagree with deeply is of eternal value and worth. An ex-bishop of Durham, previous bishop of Durham, tells a lovely story how he was invited to a rather grand social gathering it was a lunch, but with some very important civic dignitaries and the movers and shakers uh, in, in a major city. And the bishop was asked to say grace, because that's what bishops are asked to do when they go to a, a civic do. And after having said grace, the host said, thank you, bishop, for grace. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, as you enjoy your lunch, please remember that the most important and interesting person in the room today is the person sitting next to you. A lovely thought, eh? that the most important person in this gathering today is the person sitting in the pew alongside you or in front of you or behind you. That's getting towards Paul's mindset change for the community at Philippi. If there's any compassion, any sympathy, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. How can we be of the same mind? We can only be of the same mind if the centre of our shared life and the centre of my life and our lives is the person of Jesus Christ. That we are all bearers, image bearers of his nature and his spirit. It's this mutual belonging to Jesus that allows the sympathy, the compassion, the love, the sense of shared community to grow. So what are we like? Are we like a rowing eight where everybody has to do exactly the same thing or the whole thing goes off balance? I hope not. Are we like ingredients in a bake-off prize cake where we've all lost our individual uh, individuality but together we're something splendid and glorious? No, I hope we're still wonderfully various and different. Are we like the members of an orchestra playing different instruments in different ways, yet combined together to produce something beautiful. But it only works where our focus has to be on the one who leads and conducts. So let the mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. It has to be getting something nearer to that, perhaps musical image, or maybe actors on a stage, where any one individual is hogging the limelight any one individual who wants to be the centre of attention at the expense of others means the whole drama cannot work. 
And in Christ, we are invited to participate in the divine drama of the kingdom of God. We're invited to bring our part to the stage in the great drama of salvation. Called to focus not on ourselves, but only and always on Christ Jesus. There was a lovely contemporary uh, song that came around in the sort of 90s, early 20s, which said, Jesus, be the center. Be the center. That's the deepest, most profound prayer for our own lives and for our life together in community. How on earth can that be possible? It's only possible as we start to understand the rest of that letter to Philippians that was read to us this morning. Have the same mind that was you, with you that was in Christ, who, though he was in very nature God, didn't consider his equality with God as something to be grasped in a power struggle, but emptied himself. Emptied himself. Took the form of a slave. Put his own interests at the very back of any cue that there might be. And instead put himself at the service of creation. And in doing that, what Paul is reminding those early Philippian Christians is that our idea of power and Godhead are turned completely upside down. Because Caesar brought peace, but did it by war and oppression and violence and cruelty. Augustus kept peace, but did it by crushing any possible opposition. So when Jesus Christ, and Christ, of course, is that word King, Lord, Messiah, the same word that sometimes emperors might use of themselves, he's turning completely upside down our understanding of power. And so often in the world and in the church, power corrupts. Power becomes the pushing and shoving for influence. A question of who has authority for what. Sometimes the only way to express mystery is through poetry, through music. And those words, which I'll now read again quietly and slowly, are thought to be one of the earliest Christian hymns, chapter 2 of Philippians. It's set out in poetry hymn form for us. Words that we can't necessarily put into reasoned, rational argument, although there is a place for that, but which in the mystery of poetry and music convey the deeper strength of God in Christ Jesus. So as I read these words again, can I encourage all of us to reflect on that question, what does it mean to make Jesus the centre? What would my life start to look like? What would it mean for our church community to say, Jesus, be the centre? Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. who, though he was in the form of God, did not require, re regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross, as we remember in a moment. Therefore God has exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven, on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, my beloved, isn't that good? My beloved sisters and brothers, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you.
we are able to, we stand. The words of the Creed remind us that this faith journey we share with one another. That's why we say we believe, not simply I believe. We affirm the faith that we share as part of God's family. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hilary leads us in our prayers. We sit or kneel to pray. God has called us. As we gather in his name, let us bring him our prayers, which come from our love and concern. Lord, we thank you for the help and encouragement we are given from the church, from its worship, teaching, and fellowship, from its faithfulness in prayer. Bless and further all loving ministries throughout the world church, inspiring us to do what your will and to do it. We give thanks for the Penrith branch of the Mothers Union as they celebrate their 100th anniversary and we pray for all those who receive their healing blankets. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for the world where the misery and tragedy of wrong choices grieves your heart of love. Let there be wisdom and compassion in all negotiations and decisions. Let there be humility in leadership and responsibility for right action shared by all. We remember before you all those who live with insecurity and deprivation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we bring to you the joys and worries, the frustrations and accomplishments of this week in the lives we have met and shared. We pray for Naomi and Nathan, for James and Charlie, soon to be married. As we pray, let your light shine in all these lives for fresh directing and lasting good. Give us grace to respect one another and ourselves in the way we talk and think and in the way we behave. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we bring to you those we know who are ill or suffering in any way. We pray by name for Jean Nicholson, Roger Morton, Susie Atherton, Jean Cresswell, and Nikki. Lay your hand of healing on all who are ill. Restore them in body, mind, and spirit, and provide them with your indwelling. 
we pray for all carers and family who walk beside loved ones on their last journey. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we remember in your presence all those who have died, and particularly those we have known and loved. We remember by name Sheila Parsons, Alan Williams, Stuart McGluckey, Marjorie Boyce, Rosa Miller, and Margaret Carney. Thank you for their lives and for your promise of eternal life and peace. May we comfort one another through your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord, we thank you for your offer of life in all its abundance. May we accept it with joy every day of our life. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. If we're able to, we stand to share the peace. <clears throat> Christ is our unity and Christ is our peace, for he has reconciled us to God in one body on the cross. Remembering that the most interesting and important person here today is the one sitting next to you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share that peace with these fascinating people. As our gifts are brought forward and the communion table is prepared, we sing 593 verses 1, 3, 5 and 7. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. 593. turn to the prayer at the bottom of page 7 as we offer these gifts to God and with them ourselves. God of life, saviour of the poor, 
receive with this money gratitude for your goodness, penitence for our pride, and dedication to your service through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We use the second communion prayer this morning, starting at the bottom of page 10. God is faithful and we can affirm with wonder and confidence, the Lord is here, his spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Oh. Perhaps in our home language, whatever that might be, joining in the family prayer that Christ gave to his people, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. All are invited to draw near with faith, to receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for us and his blood which he shed for us. We eat and drink in remembrance that he died and lives for us and we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
These most holy gifts are the living presence and life of God in Jesus Christ, and yet all are welcome to his table of life. Come, it is the Lord who meets us here.
moment we join together <coughs> in the prayer at the bottom of page 13. In the stillness, we offer ourselves back to God as God has given himself to us in Christ Jesus. And in this communion, we have drawn near to the deep mystery of his continued life in us, through us, for us, and for the world. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Together we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Our final hymn is 818. If we're able to stand, we do so. To God be the glory, great things he has done. 818. Because after all is said and done, and there's a lot more said than done, but after all is said and done, it's all about Jesus. Whatever our preference for worship style, whatever our preference for music, whatever our preference for church architecture or church governance, and whatever we go to in this week, whether it's work or retirement, whether it's leisure or illness, it's all about Jesus. And Jesus goes with you. So may the God of grace who has called us to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus establish, strengthen and settle you in faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day, this new week and evermore. Amen.
you'd like someone to pray with you, there'll be people available to pray in the side chapel after our worship. But go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.